Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think by last count, this is number 4,673 fake news panels held in the last three months. Uh, this will not be another panel whining and wailing about fake news. Let us also stipulate at the beginning that yes, fake news is a rotten label. It's economically motivated uh, fraud and uh, politically motivated propaganda. Uh, most important, what I hope we're going to do today is to look at the bright side. And I'll try to find one and mine it. Uh, and, and I, and I, and I want to go two areas. First, what do we do? What do we think we can do to fix this? And second, where are there other opportunities for what I think is the potential for a flight to quality, which should matter to all of us? Uh, and, and finally, I want to acknowledge that this is not just about the platforms. Uh, it's not just about Facebook and Google. It's not just about the publishers either. It's also about technology companies, advertising agencies, ad networks, uh, ad technology companies, uh, PR companies, political entities, and so on. Everyone has a role in this. So I'd like to start just by asking each of you that if you could go to one of those constituencies and have them do one thing to improve uh, the lot of life of quality news or, 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 or get rid of, of uh, the, the crap, uh, who would it be and what would it be? Rebecca. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I think if people could do one thing, it would be to pay for journalism. And um, I'm happy to report that more and more people are doing this. Uh, you know, you've all heard of President Trump tweeting about the failing New York Times. And we just announced last week that in the first quarter, the Times added 300,000 new subscribers, which was a historic record. Um, this is very important for... Uh, for, for journalism, not just for the Times. We're seeing increases across you know, the, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post. I'm on the board of the Columbia Journalism Review. They're seeing a surge of subscriptions there. And uh, traditional news organizations are really struggling right now to compete against Facebook and Google. They've got a double whammy with a, a, a steep, steep, in some ways, un unanticipatedly fast uh, decline in print advertising. And so subscribing and paying for a subscription is, uh, is more important than ever before. And thankfully, the most amazing thing that's happened in the past few months is that consumers, many, many consumers, many more than ever before, have realized that they have to pay. And, and I would argue uh, for, for anyone who cares about quality news, paying for a local paper, a national paper, paying for something is, is the most important thing that one can do. John. So I think the constituency that I would, um, I would select are the users. And I think that you know, if I could wish for one thing, it would be for people to, which I think is starting to happen, people to demand the platforms, social sharing platforms, to actually give them some control over their attention back. I think we have, um, you know, we, social media has, and the business of social media has become somewhat of a casino. And we just have kept spinning the wheel faster and faster, and it's been a race to the bottom for publishers, for users, for sharing, for sort of social stimulation, sort of mob mentality on those platforms. And I think that, um, I think for users to actually ask for that, you know, that they want the platforms that they spend a significant amount of their time and attention on to, um, uh, to give them a higher quality, or at least a separation, I think would be, that would be awesome. Because I think that users demanding that these platforms are actually serving up a, a, a lot of crap, as you put it, is, um, is what's going to get the platforms to change. The experience on these platforms is becoming, um, we've sort of all admitted now post the election, I think, and the use of the term fake news, I think, is an acknowledgement that we've developed a system that is this you know, fun casino, but it's a lot of it is just rubbish. But if we're going to, and, and, and I, I agree, but if we're going to put more on the users, then we, there's also a responsibility that falls on the users to stop spreading the crap, to recognize the responsibility they have uh, to take the extra second to wonder why they're spreading what they're spreading, yes? Right, right. But I think that that is, there's this, there's a relationship between the users, the platforms, the publishers, you know, that goes all the way down to the pixel layout, right? So something you and I have talked about a, a bit in the past is, is that um, there's really only one publisher out there, which is The Guardian, that puts an overlay on top of its stories in, um, in Facebook. And um, I checked with them a couple of weeks ago, and it's actually a hack that they've figured out how to do that. Yep. And so you go to, I, I, did, I looked about uh, a week ago, I looked at two stories. So there was the um, Prince, uh, Prince Philip in the UK 
um, uh, decided to retire from his duties. So newsworthy, but nothing, not salacious, right? Hopefully. Um, and, then there was, <laughs> and then there was the debate between Macron and Le Pen, which was, you know, three hours, a little bit more salacious. And I did a search of both of those on Facebook, admittedly not a um, scientific example, but I did just a search through the day and compared those stories. And the, the, your lack of ability as you scroll the feed to actually distinguish what a publisher is. So all those pixels matter so much. And the publisher's been able to say to Facebook, hey, we actually want to make sure the story is from you know, a, uh, a, an inst a, a company that's creating news versus um, a blogger who, uh, you know, just... Yeah, if we don't make the brand and the source more uh, apparent to the user, they, it makes it harder for them to make good judgments, and so it means we've got to yeah. be a partner on that. Yeah, so it's all a cycle. Rahul. So, uh, initially, I was going to go with the advertisers uh, and the responsibility. I think that they now are learning that they can control more where their, where their ads are running. Uh, and... Uh, as we've talked a lot about, I think one of the ways that we can help in regards to uh, what's happening with the spread of misinformation and fake news is to choke off the money supply uh, and the business of fake news that this is, that, that has become. But the interesting one that I've, we've started to obsess over is the responsibility that I think some of the closed networks have as well, where we talk all about, we've talked all the time about the big social platforms, but so much of the spread of this content is starting on platforms like Reddit and Discord and 4chan. 4chan, 4chan, yep. And they're somehow getting away with no one uh, talking about how they have some form of a responsibility around how you stop that. I mean, we get into this, but we talked a little, we did some work together around the French election, and uh, so much of this content and the spread of misinformation and the planning was happening in closed networks. So we, it, it, it's... I think they have a big responsibility that people haven't looked to address this yet. Storeful's done very good work tracking back things like the Macron is gay meme and where it, where it came up through the system. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not just those platforms, though. I think it's also important for the, the, the big platforms, Facebook and Google, to be more transparent about the efforts to manipulate them and thus us. Yes. And, it's more, and it's wiser for us in media to be a lot more savvy about this and think that's not just a story. It's an effort to manipulate us and democracy. You cover a place <laughs> that has, uh, shall we say, a manipulated democracy. You're responsible for coverage of, among other places, Russia. I don't know why there's a lot of emphasis on Russia here this morning. <laughs> um, what's your fix? Um, I would say um, I wouldn't start with Russia at the moment. <laughs> uh, I would start with Google um, and uh, would like to see them improve their search algorithm. For example, I'll give you um, this. Um, Last year, uh, you, you all know we have this refugee. Cri we had this refugee crisis, and Angela Merkel welcomed more or less uh, uh, one million refugees from mostly Islamic uh, countries. And in uh, mid of last year, you could, and I, I think you can still do it, uh, into uh, Google and search for Angela Merkel Ramadan, and then you will see on the second place. Uh, something from so-called Morocco World News Network saying that Angela Merkel personally gave a tax, a tax uh, privilege to Muslim um, restaurant owners in Germany uh, for their, so that their countrymen could uh, give um, uh, cheaper food. This is a fake story, but it's on the second place. Uh, in, in, in on search Google, and on the sixth place, you can see the the, the German version of this um, f from a website you would call alt right, um, and they also have have this information. And my debunking story on this is on the second page, on the nineteenth place, and you see that that is one of the biggest problems. I think that Google has no. Um, has no quality uh, signal into their search, search algorithm, at least for this case. And I think there are a lot of more cases. I think that's just changing, though. Um, ben Gomes, who's the senior engineer in charge of search at Google, wrote two weeks ago that they are going to start accounting for reliable sources, authoritative sources, and quality. That's a very big deal, I think. That the, the myth that the platforms are just mirrors, the same myth we thought in media, we're just a mirror society. Society is, wha is cracked and warped and whacked to try to manipulate us. And we've got to do a better job of balancing that as a result. Rebecca, I'm, I'm curious, having gone from the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. to the New York Times, um, 
Uh-oh. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, a fascinating journalistic culture shock, I imagine, in some ways not at all, it's journalism, but in other ways, uh, the way the country views these two institutions mm -hmm. and the way that this country views journalism as a whole. Uh, on the right, I think that we in liberal media, where you now are, uh, lost the trust and faith of conservative media going back, conservative <laughs> America going back in the, 60s, in the 70s. Uh, is that a factor in, in all of this? Is the m mistrust of the media and news as a whole a factor here? And what the hell do we do about that? No, it's certainly a factor. I mean, there's, there's no question that if you look at the Pew studies, if you look at, 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 the, at the trust in media over time, it's been eroding. And, uh, and we've seen that everywhere. We've seen that at the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times as well. Um, it's a misnomer a bit to think that the Wall Street Journal is a conservative news uh, organization. They have a conservative uh, opinion page that actually went to war against President Trump um, uh, uh, during the election uh, and was fascinating to watch. Um, but the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times, both newsrooms are really trying to cover the country in a, in a way that represents uh, both sides. I think there's no question that... Um, that the traditional media skipped a lot of what happened during the last election. I'm I'm originally from Michigan, and you know the middle of the country is is a place that you know too few journalists are living and working. Um, the Wall Street Journal did, I think, probably a better job in some respects, looking at the economic causes of of the dislocation. Um, uh, at the Journal, they did a they did a series looking at uh, communities that had lost jobs to China, and uh, I think 79% of those communities went for President Trump in the primaries. And so I think the Journal, in many ways, was was ahead of looking at the economic uh, consequences. But but at the times, what we're trying to do now is is really try to, to redress this as much as possible. We started a feature um, twice a week, re readings from the right, readings from the left. Um, there's a podcast called The Daily um, that uh, we launched four months ago that is making a concerted attempt to represent balance in, in sound. And it's really powerful to listen to a coal miner, to the mother of, um, of uh, a, a woman who was murdered and and um, you know and whose accuser is on death row to get her perspective and 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 we're really trying to to represent the other side because clearly the traditional media does bear some fault for people kind of giving up. So, um, John, Raul, you and I have done a lot of talking about uh, the signals around news. Google and Facebook, I think, in the end, are in the signal business. They gather signals, they generate signals, they use signals to to rank what they do. Uh, and you're asking for a, for a change in that at Facebook, uh, uh, and then and then Storyful, Moat, and CUNY have just announced a, a partnership to try to get the bad signals at first, later on good signals, of of media, so that advertisers can make more responsible decisions. So I want to talk about if Google is now looking at quality. Mark Zuckerberg has talked about. Uh, uh, separating the good from the bad. Uh, announcement yesterday at Facebook. They're also looking at quality. You've asked them to look at quality. How the hell do you? Define quality. How, what's, what are the signals of quality? Besides, yes, the big brands. Though in some circles, people would disagree. Fine, we'll we'll stipulate that. But how else do we recognize? It, it's a little easier to recognize the bad stuff. It's only been around for two weeks. It's viral. It came up from 8chan. I mean, we can we can look at those signals. If we're going to convince the platforms to give more presence to quality authority and so on, how do we help them do that? Either of you. So, um, I mean, I think that generally, you know, the, both of this question and the previous questions sort of, you know, are circling around this question of truth, and which I think we have a complex relationship to truth right now. <laughs> and journalism, um, I think, always has, and I think algorithms always have. And I think that right now, is it, it's a really important time for us as a culture, as a society, to start thinking through this stuff. Because when you think of the technology that's coming, where you can manipulate voices, videos, you know, through um, machine learning, artificial intelligence, if you want to call it that, um, we, it's going to get a lot more complicated really fast. So specifically on the question of truth today, I think the daily, which you mentioned the podcast, what I find so interesting about that is, is it's, it's not only good content well narrated, but it's also a look behind the scenes at the construction of media. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things that's, uh, that the media have done a poor job of to date is actually understanding the sort of endemic qualities of the new mediums 
And instead of just putting out more print or slapping a bit of video here because it monetizes better, actually thinking about how they can sort of expose sources and sort of unpack the what's underneath. Because at a very high level, I think, you know, the first question, you know, everybody sort of says, answered that they want you know, there to be more filtering based on reputation up top. That is a hack that is a quick, and I think it's a quick hack that can make things a bit better. But the, what's you know, happened over the last you know, 15 years, which is remarkable, is this massive democratization of publishing and content creation. And so we which want we to celebrate. Yeah, which we, and we've got to figure out a way how to make that and understand what is you know, um, uh, what, what that media is. And I think that unpacking the media, giving a more, uh, more perspective around it is an important part of it. As a signal we provide, Raul? As a signal. So, I mean, our business was pretty much founded on the democratization of storytelling and, 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 and the media industry. I think the two things that are really interesting is if you look at how our newsroom works, it's very traditional journalistic techniques. We're looking for sources. We're looking for who are the people that are trusted voices. Uh, if you look at what the platforms can do, okay, some of what we, uh, uh, Mandy Jenkins, who runs our newsroom, talks a lot about the challenges that we have in local news in in the local news situation in the United States, where local publishers are basically by the day dropping off. Yeah. And if you look at uh, places like Michigan or uh, pick of a state in this country, in, in this country, and the amount of local publishers that are now around that were trusted sources, right? These were the papers that most people were following, whether it was on Facebook or Twitter or somewhere else, or the journalists from those papers, that are no longer there. And then you have the situation of the Denver Guardian that all of a sudden pops up, or fake sites like that that all of a sudden many people believe to be true because it's like, hey, that's my local paper or a, a version of that. So I think it's, it, it could be, maybe it's rather naive or simplistic, but the ability to at least map out who are trusted sources and voices and, and publishers and platforms to at least begin to be able to identify them as verified sources and build that out in a, there's, there's, there's ways to mimic and copy some aspects of what Twitter does with this, with a blue tick that could be brought across all platforms. Well, I, I, think, there's a, I, I think there's a weak underbelly to that argument. Sure. That what we're really seeing going on is an institutional revolution. People are resenting institutions and institutions of power. That includes us in media, it includes government, Lord knows, it includes the academe, it includes science. The institution of fact and science is being challenged. Stupidly, but it's being challenged. So, in the one hand, our reflex is to say, let's point to the institutions of trust, and let's say who's trustworthy, but I'm not sure that's going to fly in the quarters where it matters. Right. I, I, so, I think that... I wonder... I, I think that a simple sort of whitelist, blacklist is, is, a, is a crude instrument that's yeah. not what we need. Agreed. I do think that there's, so there's something that we've, you know, we don't have a lot of data on because, it's, because these algorithms are closed and it's hard to get any real data on this. But if you go back to Google search, you know, sort of the first 15 years of Google search, it was driven primarily by page rank mm -hmm. and by a, a page's relationship to other pages which was essentially a sophisticated, organic way of, rep, of, of determining reputation. And I think that I suspect that in the last five years that PageRank and Google's algorithm has been heavily informed by social signals yes. to make it more real time. And as a consequence, yeah. that skew towards social signals yeah. has made, you know, to your example, um, it has, you know, there's countless examples of this um, where the, so I think that, that that was actually a very sophisticated whitelist, blacklist, gray list. Yeah, it was. They have to account for the manipulation again, which means at some level they have to do what we say we don't want them to do, which is to be the arbiters of truth and to be the arbiters of authority. And, and we were in media, and then, but we're saying, no, Google and Facebook, we don't want you to, to, to do that. But I think an essential thing here is to acknowledge that Facebook and Google have become media platforms. And, uh, it, it, you know, whether or not Mark Zuckerberg wants that, it's the reality. And surely there has to be a better way to assign 
you know, algorithmically, uh, you know, in some, in some way, shape, or form, value to trusted content, verifiable content. I think we all saw during the election the dangers of, you know, the most famous one is the Pope in endorsing President Trump. Um, and uh, I, I, I guess I would push back a bit in the sense that, you know, uh, you know people will forever doubt institutions. I actually think, um, you know, uh, recently and looking at, you know, what's at stake in France and Germany, what just happened in the U.S., that people are kind of waking up and saying, wait, there's a, there's a danger here in just looking at anything in my feed and believing it, and, and I, I want more distinctions. And, you know, I think it's, there's no, it's no accident that Times actually, you know, did its first brand campaign ever on trust, and the truth is hard. Um, you know, I think journalists everywhere are kind of redoubled in their efforts to, uh, to try to earn the trust of, of readers and consumers in ways never before. But I'm not sure we know how to do it. And, and, and I think that, by the way, I don't think that Facebook and Google are actually media companies, because I think that they are something new. The media platforms. They're, they're, I think calling them media is us putting those round holes in our square pegs. They are connection companies. They connect people to each other. They, they build communities, they connect people to information. I think we've got to learn from them rather than trying to impose our Welt Anschauung on them, but that's a different discussion. Ingo, um, you sit at the crossroads once again of the world. You sit in Germany watching Russia and seeing what's going on here in the US. Uh, are there lessons to learn from what happens in Russia? Um, uh, are they our new masters? Uh, <laughs> what, What's your perspective on the on sitting in the middle of, of, of the two bears? Uh, yeah, interesting question because um, actually when I followed the discussion in the US in the last year, I was always reminded of what happened in Russia in the last, last five to ten years because a lot of social hacking techniques were used in Putin's Russia against the opposition uh, to discredit them, uh, to, 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 to avert the perception of, of reality to, to other, other things. So um, I think, yeah, we can s see and learn a lot from what happened in Russia in the last 10, 15 years. Um, uh, and when, when we're looking now at, at Russia, uh, at, at the US, uh, firstly. Um, secondly, I think the way that, l let's say it from my perspective, the way the US is discussing it at the moment, you are making Putin your master. Mm. Because... Uh, <laughs> Tweet that, please. <laughs> because in a way, it's exactly what he desires. Uh, or he desired, because now you are you are you are talking about distrusting your institutions. You are talking about trust. Um, is is it really true that that the Americans do not trust the 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 the, the New York Times or uh, Washington Post or, or certain companies? Oh, okay, when we talk about the media, uh, I I know this from Germany as well. A lot of people say. Um, uh, I don't trust the media because there was no report about this and that. And then I say, okay, where did you found it? And they said, yeah, I found it in the media. And so it's 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 a little bit strange for me to 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 see this argument. We we shouldn't we shouldn't do what they want us to do. That to 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 destabilize our countries with our by by improving our self uh, not confidence or the, the the so so that's a really really fascinating point and and really difficult to grapple with how do we not fall into these traps right we fell into the trap of trump uh, uh, he's a showman T tv wants a showman you show and people seem to be liking him so it it it, it fed on itself um, when we fact check fake news certain quarters like that because it says, aha, they're against us. It becomes an us versus them. It's not a, a discussion based on fact. Um, so we're stuck in a paradox here of how we cover these things, but how we don't fall into their trap. Do you have any guidance for us in American journalism based on that? If we're, if we're doing it wrong, what's right? I think um, we shouldn't panic. Uh, you shouldn't panic. You shouldn't uh, start with hysteria. Uh, what we need, or what you need, well, from my perspective, is you need an honest investigation of what happened last year, uh, unbiased and, and be bipartisan. A little panicked about that now. Yeah, I know, I know, <laughs> I know about that. But uh, still, this is, I think, a very important point. But, and then to, to change and adjust to the system. 
Um, but uh, I, I think you shouldn't panic. And at the moment, for me, from the outside world, the US is panicking. And that, that isn't helpful at the moment for the world. If I might just add, I think that uh, you know facts are important, and that's just something we need to take a step back and, and, and acknowledge and accept. I mean, what's been happening, we were talking before, just the pace of news in the past uh, three months is, is just been unrelenting. It's exhausting for any news organization. But I think, I think that um, you know, we all have redoubled our attempts to, to confirm facts, to represent both sides of stories, to do the investigative, you talked about the daily and the painstaking work of journalism and putting together the pieces of, of the Russian influence from the election, which believe me is ongoing at many news organizations. Um, every day to hold um, to account, to, to, to kind of look at the impact of, of the Trump administration and also to try to better understand the, the reasons that, that Trump was elected, I think is really important. But facts are, facts are not kind of this, 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 you know, that's past bygone era. And I think right, right. that, uh, you know, I think that that's a really important thing to acknowledge and also just the hard work involved right now in presenting original journalism that is like making news that's presenting new facts to what we know. Do you want to add back in? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's really important to, to stay cool because when we are talking about the Russian influence in, in the US election, what are we talking about? Are we talking about, did they really hack any election computer? I'm not sure, I don't know, but this would be hacking the, the election. They, they, hack, they hack media. They yeah. hacked us. Yeah, what do you mean by hacked media? They, they had their influence operation, they had their info, info, information operations. Yeah, of course, what, but this is not something new. This happened all the time in the, in the, in the, in the West during the Cold War, and we still survived. <laughs> so um, they, we had this before, so I, I'm, I'm not sure so, about so, this. So, all right, so, so but her emails, but her emails. So did the New York Times and the, 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 the law is different in France. Uh, Sorry. I like that, but it's uh, a little over uh, The law, of course, is different in France that when the, when the dump of documents happened against Macron there, it couldn't come out. Mm -hmm. Nonetheless, there was, I think, a different behavior in France, and I think perhaps maybe French media learned from American mistakes. Did, did we learn anything from France in this election? Well, that's an interesting question, uh, and uh, you know, I think you're going to see some. There was so little time in France before the documents came out, um, and there were obviously French laws. But you know, but look, if, if if facts are out there, if documents are out there, I think there is an obligation of media to to uh, to report it and to suss it out, and certainly to question its providence, which the media probably could have done a much better job of during the last election. Um, I think there is something to just you know, kind of credulously getting the documents and, and reporting them. But um, I think we need to make distinctions between media as well. I mean, there's, there's the TV networks and CNN and the nonstop coverage, there's local news, there's, there's more traditional news organizations, and there's a whole spectrum of, of behavior. So I think we need to be careful not to lump it in. But, but in France, it is rather remarkable to see that, that uh, news organizations did not report um, did not report the contents of these uh, emails. And uh, I think that will happen over time. And I think had there been more time involved before the election, it would have been probably different. But this is, a, this is an important First Amendment, uh, not that that exists it, in it France. It's, is. A, it's, a, it's a really important principle that's at stake here. It's also a principle of the internet. And I, uh, you know, I believe in and love the open internet, but I, when I look at Twitter, I wonder whether openness necessarily breeds trolling and bad behavior. And is there a price to openness? So are we asking for more, ironically, asking for more control? I, so I think that's the key point here. I think this is actually bigger than saying that the, the media industry was quote unquote hacked during the last election. I think what's going on is there's a war around the spread of information, right? The ability to manipulate these platforms and the spread of information is turned into a full-time business. Uh, and you saw it with, I think you saw it with the last election in the US and you certainly saw it over the last couple of weeks with the French election. Mm -hmm. What was really interesting, what's coming out, is not only when it came to the leak, uh, the, the email leaks, it was how the uh, Macron camp was also spreading information to basically throw signals for p folks off. They recognize that this is bigger than just the spread of information. This is, this is a world war that's happening. And I, I think that's why, and I'm, again, I come back to Crawl, walk, run. 
It may sound simplistic to go back to black, gray, and white list, but it, we got to start somewhere. And you start with the lowest hanging rotten fruit, and, yes. and that's what we started. That's what we've looked to do with uh, with together with this OBS project. But I, I think to go to the platforms to say you have to make these ten changes, we've been screaming about this for years. So, so they're John, not listening. You're the closest here to you're the bridge between us and Silicon Valley. I, I go out a fair amount as well. How do we? What do we? What what? What message do we have to get across? At a, at a level of responsibility, not tactics, but a higher level of responsibility of, of if we as in journalism and media think we have a social responsibility, and I think the platforms do believe they do as well, but I'm not sure they know how to do it. How do we help them? What do we communicate to them? What, what's going to, to uh, make that partnership work with technologists? Yeah, so that's, I think it's a good question. It's a complex question because I think culturally the, these, te these technology companies are so different in terms of um, how they prioritize, how they're, how they're managed, how they work. Um, and, and I think that they're, um, at, at a very fundamental level, their d DNA is often structured around optimization. And um, I don't think, if you, if you frame this as an optimization problem, you're gonna, you go back to the casino. And so I think that there's a... So it's a quality problem? So it's a, it's a quality problem, and it's about opening the prism. I can see we're short on time. I want to mention oh. one word that hasn't come up, surprisingly, in this whole discussion, and that is remarkably lacking in a lot of these discussions, is Twitter. Mm. Because, um, you know, I know that the... I mean, the data, the data is clear. The, the, the massive share of sharing and problems happening on Facebook. But Twitter, as a non-algorithmically filtered feed here has a very important function. So it's not just raising Twitter because it would be nice to have a second platform um, of scale, but it's also a platform that has a very different structure to its follow graph. Can we afford that openness? And, and I think that figuring out how to, if Twitter can be, if Twitter can maybe kind of be successful at making discovery and um, that, that the, the raw access to those feeds um, more accessible to people in general instead of just the inside media, I think that that would, um, that would be a big deal. Same with, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, more, more discoverable to whom? Well, to, I think to people in general. I think that yeah. Twitter has been very successful at feeding the media. Yeah. And so as, as technology is eating the media and media is eating the media, Twitter's just feeding the media, eating the media a bit. <laughs> um, I mean, it's this, bizarre, it's this bizarre hall of mirrors that we're in, and I think that Twitter has just accelerated that. And I think that it actually has a meta role, which is giving people, citizens, in, uh, people who want to be informed about a subject, a direct access, unfiltered access to a point of view. Yeah, including the lying <coughs> president. Yes. Role. Uh, that too. That too. Yeah. I mean, that's 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 an issue. I I I love openness. I love the open net. I I I am too addicted to Twitter, but I also recognize what it what comes along with it. The bridge with the trolls underneath comes along. Yeah. And I don't think that the answer to that is to edit Twitter. I'm not suggesting that, but I think we have to be a lot more savvy on the outside about how it is being used and manipulated to manipulate us and others. Well, right. I, and, but this is the responsibility that I think Twitter has. The, the percentage of bots of their total users is incredible. And you looked at what... Uh, what do again, you guys estimate that to be? As we see six, in like 60, 70 uh, million. So what does that mean in terms of if I have 10 million followers, like somebody did at the election time, what's that mean? Mm. Uh, <laughs> You're not as popular as you think, no. <laughs> um, I'm not. <laughs> I, th I think the... Um, but a large number of those a followers. Large, a large number of those followers are bots. And I think the, the fascinating part, to, exactly to your point, is if you even look at the story of, say, the Pope endorses Trump, the initial spread of that information was a, was a shotgun blast on Twitter uh, where it was paid promotion to push that as fast and wide as possible and then expecting the long tail on Facebook yeah. for that story to take on over time. And, and Facebook to its recent credit in France, did recognize that fake accounts yes. right. were a huge issue. Twitter doesn't do that. I've watched, I watched a very responsible organization that created a bot to be able to answer fake news with just truth. That's it, right? But yeah. they got rate limited immediately by Twitter, and they had one account. And 
they were fighting thousands and thousands of bots. And I said to somebody from Twitter, well, well no, it's just equal. It's all equal. It's all even. Everybody has the same chat. What, the same chance to create fake bots? Right, let me end here, Raul. Yeah. Uh, the other party we haven't talked about here is advertising, really. Yes. And um, you're working to try to help advertisers avoid the crap, and we yes. hope in the future to find the good stuff. Um, but the question remains, will advertisers be willing to pay a premium for safety and quality. I talked to one ad executive who said that he was looking at a kind of run of YouTube buy now versus a quality buy, and the premium was going to be something like 50% to buy the quality buy. Hmm. And I said, what are your advertisers going to say? And he said, they're going to shit bricks because they're so used to paying ever, ever lower rates, and we end up in a, <laughs> it's, it's the last gasp of mass media where we end up just going for reach for reach's sake. I, Is there I hope that advertisers can come along and help support quality? I think they. I don't. I think they've realized that they don't have a choice uh, because I think. Uh, look, I think it's nonsense that they say that they, the 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 prices will reach levels that are too high for them. I think they all want quality. They just don't want to pay for it, uh, and. That in itself is, is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to digital advertising today. Uh, the, the, I think uh, the, the, Times are, the Times of London has done some incredible reporting around what's happened with the platforms and uh, where advertisers are seeing their ads around what content. And it's been going on for years. Uh, and I think it's finally gotten to the point where agencies and brands alike have woken up to say, I need to know better where my content is running and, it's, and I want to know better where, in front of who is, it, is that content running, and I'm willing to pay for it. And give credit in the end to the users on the platforms to start things like Sleeping Giants and Grab yeah. Your Wallet to create the pressure on the advertisers, mm -hmm. which I hope leads to a flight to quality. So we'll leave on that optimistic note, and thank you very much. Mm -hmm.